Welcome to Music Appreciation at Southside High School. This is Mr. Weaver, and I'm glad that you could uh, see this video on YouTube. If you are seeing this, uh, chances are that you have uh, either uh, you're absent and you're trying to catch up on a day that you've missed, or perhaps uh, you're dealing with an unfortunate uh, circumstance such as a quarantine due to COVID-19, or um, perhaps you're just uh, out and wanting to, to catch up, and uh, or you've been in class and you're looking at this video to try and uh, go through again something that we've already covered in class. Either way, this is our opening video, our opening presentation for a five-part series on music history uh, we call The Story of Music. And in this five-part series, we're going to be looking at how and why music has evolved the way it has. We'll trace all the things that have happened along the way that have had an impact on music and directly shaped uh, the world that we live in today. This unit, uh, I'm sorry, rather, this video is uh, going to cover the music of the ancients. So we're going all the way back to antiquity up to 1300 AD. This is our uh, third unit. Uh, like I said, this is a five-part series that we'll be going through. And uh, since it's the first one, there's a little bit more setup that we have to go through. As you're watching this video, please feel free to uh, pause when needed or if you want to increase the speed of the playback so as to get through the information more quickly that would be fine all of the uh, relevant information that accompanies this video and presentation you can find in Schoology uh, under unit 3 so what's our goal what are we going to learn in this unit well before we talk about what we're going to learn let's get this caveat out of the way and that's this, that today in the 21st century, it's very easy for us to take for granted the fact that we have at our fingertips instant access to all information and all media of any form. We are saturated, inundated with music constantly. It's around us. We hear it in uh, the music that we're trying to listen to. We hear it in ads. We hear it uh, all around us all the time. The way we live now is vastly different from the way that the uh, bulk of humans throughout history have lived. And even as uh, not far back as my generation and your parents, uh, this has been a big change. Now, in my generation and your parents' generation, we had uh, really, really easy access to music through different media, through uh, vinyl records, cassette tapes, CDs, uh, even the early uh, uh, digital media storage devices. But just uh, since the time that I was in high school and college, this has vastly uh, changed through the invention of the iPod and through uh, smartphones and streaming technology. Um, music is a much bigger part of our day-to-day -day lives than it ever has been uh, at any other time in human history. And the, uh, the effects of that are numerous. One of them is that uh, the music itself has changed. Ever since recorded sound, when other artists and composers and musicians have been able to hear other music, um, it, of course, music has evolved more rapidly. And even in the past 10 to 15 years, uh, that has even been more accelerated, uh, given how easy it is to access music and uh, to be influenced by it. But not that long ago, we have to remember that music was a rare treat reserved for the elite, the rich and the fortunate. And even as uh, not that historically speaking, not that long ago as the 19th century, the 1800s, one might only expect to hear their favorite piece of music four or five times in their life. So what we're going to be looking at is how did we get to where we are today? In this series, we're going to try to trace music's journey and evolution through time and, and examine the things that uh, altered it along the way and the different causes and effects that created what we have today. But the last caveat here is this. We need to try our best to hear this music that we're going to be discussing throughout the series uh, and the things that we're going to be discussing, we need to try to hear those with the ears of the people who are hearing this music for the first time. And that could be the most difficult thing to do. A uh, couple of other uh, quick notes for you to think about. One is that nobody ever lived in the past. They lived in their present. They didn't know how it was going to turn out in their day any more than we do. 
No one ever lived in the past. They lived in their present. No one lived in a simpler time. It was only different. Sure, less technology, but people are people. They were doing the best they could with what they had, and uh, things were just different, not necessarily simpler. Uh, so the thing that miss, I think most people miss out on when they, uh, when they talk about history is that they forget that it's human. And that what we're going to try to do in this unit is give you some of the context and try to set the stage for what life was like for the people that we're discussing so that their art makes more sense. So, where do we begin? Well, that's not an easy thing to do. Because for the bulk of human history, there's just not a lot of stuff that we know about. In fact, the bulk of our history is what we call the prehistoric era, prehistory, before things could be written down. We don't really know for sure. Before there were any written records, everything is just a best guess. What you're looking at here is a mural in a cave system in Chauvet, France, and it's some of the earliest known artwork in human history. There are different scenes here that depict uh, our hunter-gatherer ancestors on the hunt. Uh, there's uh, breathtaking pictures and drawings here of animals and people hunting. Also get art like this, uh, hand paintings, basically people saying that they were here, proof that they loved and, and mattered and existed, and that's a powerful image. Now, not only are these paintings a, a signature, but they also depict scenes in every life. Well, music may seem like a luxury to us today, and we may wonder uh, about uh, these hunter-gatherer ancestors, but uh, they did have music. We know that they did. We don't know what it sounded like, but we have found lots and lots of instruments, hollowed out bone flutes and among the other artifacts. And of course, we don't know what this music sounded like, but we do know that it was important to them. In 2008, scientists have discovered that the chambers where these paintings are located were not randomly placed. In fact, they seem to be deliberately located at points within the cave system of great acoustical resonance. That means the places where the sound would travel the furthest. These earliest known musical instruments, simple flutes carved out of bone, have been found in and around all of these caves. Scientists now believe that perhaps our ancestors used music as a means of echolocation to help people navigate the labyrinth of cave systems. Remember, if the torch went out, one wrong turn could lead to disaster. Well, let's move forward a bit to the earliest civilizations. So after our uh, ancestors stopped being nomadic, stopped being hunter-gatherers, they wanted to settle down. Well, of course, the technology that's needed to sustain large populations is agriculture. You have to be able to grow more food than you can hunt. That's the only way that you're going to be able to support a large population that's statically located. There are some other things as well. But interestingly enough, the other thing that's really needed for civilization is a means of communication and record keeping and writing things down. The earliest examples that we have of a written language are in fact uh, of agricultural records. They're a means of, of keeping grain storage. Uh, and seeing how much food is being produced and keeping track of it all. So in these early civilizations, dating roughly about 10,000 years ago, uh, these uh, civilizations were developing in what's called the Fertile Crescent in the uh, Mesopotamian area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Let's so look at ancient civilizations. Now we know that they had music because they wrote about it, and we know a lot more about their day-to-day -day lives than we, of course, would our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Uh, but we don't know a whole lot about what the music might sound like. There's a lot we do know, but there's, of course, a lot that we do not know. This is a fresco. This is a, um, uh, a, a wall painting uh, from ancient Egypt, where this gentleman on the left is uh, playing a flute, and the uh, person on the right there is possibly telling them they're a little sharp. Looks like they've got their hand covering their ear, uh, saying, oh, I don't know about that note. 
But uh, the ancient Egyptians wrote a lot about part of their elaborate religious beliefs and uh, uh, ceremonies. And we also know that they had recreational music as well. This instrument on the left is a, an ancient Greek, I'm sorry, an ancient Egyptian harp. And the instrument on the right, interestingly enough, is a banjo. The banjo is a, an African instrument, and it dates all the way back to ancient Egypt. But again, what did this music sound like? That's the question. Well, sadly enough, we just don't have any idea. No written language means that we know very little about this period of our history at all. And even when we do have a written language, we don't have a means of writing down music. In fact, it's not going to be until the 3rd century AD, that's the 200s, that we have any sort of concrete idea about what the music of our ancestors sounded like. So in um, this course, we'll be covering Western music. Uh, now, that's not to say that Western music is any more or uh, less important than any other type of world music, and we will certainly be studying other world musics uh, later on in the course, but Western music is by far the more advanced and developed systematic approach to music. And so that's what this course will be uh, focusing on. So Western civilization, Western music with a capital W, is based off of a number of different influences, but the oldest one being the ancient Greeks. Now, you know those people, the guys who invented uh, modern uh, civilization, democracy, the toga party, kind of a big deal. They were um, a very progressive society, fiercely devoted to freedom and intellectual integrity and to self-improvement. Uh, they discovered geometry, built monuments, uh, championed democracy in the arts, and it's worth knowing that one of their mandatory subjects in school for study, among the others, was music. Uh, other than music, they would be studying grammar, rhetoric, arithmetic, logic, geometry, astronomy, and music. They all studied music. It was a big part of their culture and their heritage. Now, we get several things from the ancient Greeks musically. The most notable is that we get the idea of key. Now, the ancient Greeks called them modes. Today, we call them keys. So, in our second unit on music's fundamentals, we learned that there are 12 notes, 12 distinct, measurably different musical tones in Western music. Now, they repeat themselves high and low, but there are only 12 unique musical sounds. But within a key family, within a scale, within a key, we only really use seven of those notes. We give those uh, a letter name, A through G. Now, we get this idea from the ancient Greeks. They didn't call them keys. They called them modes. And modes are a, a proto-scale. They're, they're a way of... of organizing your musical tones. You can think of it as a family of, of sounds. And these different modes, there were seven, and uh, these different modes are based off of, uh, their names are based off of the different ethnic groups where they could be found. Uh, for example, the first uh, mode here up at the top left uh, picture is the Ionian mode. Uh, we also have the Dorian mode, the Phrygian mode, the Lydian, the Mixolydian, the Aeolian, and the Locrian modes. Now, if you look at the bottom left-hand picture, you'll see uh, a, a little description there showing how the Greeks mathematically measured out all of the different notes. They would use, just like we do, seven notes in their modes. Uh, today, the, the tying together of this is that in our modern uh, Western music, we have an all-purpose major and minor scale, and uh, those are straight up two of the seven modes. The modern-day major scale is the Ionian mode. The modern-day natural minor scale is the Aeolian mode. It's a major scale with a lowered third, sixth, and seventh note. Uh, the blues scale, which is more popular uh, today in a lot of pop music, is sort of an alteration of uh, this mode. Of, it's kind of a, a combination that emits one of the notes 
of the Ionian and the Aeolian um, modes. But uh, for our purposes, what you need to know is that we get the idea of key families uh, called modes from the ancient Greeks, and they named them based off of the different ethnic groups in Greece. Now, the Greeks also loved talent contests or singing contests, uh, and music was a part of the original Olympic Games. It wasn't all just about nude running and wrestling. Uh, they a big part of the Olympic Games were singing contests, and the Olympians would compete, uh, among other things, for cash prizes. This is the beginning of music as a profession. The Greeks also loved drama. Now today, modern theater is uh, very based, very much based off of the Greek model of drama. The Greeks had two main types of drama, comedy and tragedy. Comedy just means they lived. Tragedy means that everybody died. And the uh, dialogue that we have that still survives, you can read it. And in fact, in your history, uh, or your English classes rather, I hope that you will be covering some Greek drama but you'll read it as an as a play. It'll uh, be like reading a script. But there's some evidence to indicate that this might have been sung. So uh, some of what you'll be reading and acting would have might actually have been sung. Now we know that they had music. We don't know if all the dialogue uh, was sung, or only some of it was, or maybe none of it was, and the music was just there as backup, as accompaniment. But we don't know what it sounded like, because for all the Greeks, uh, wonderful advancements in society, they did not have a way of writing their music down. Well, there is this one exception. This is the epitaph of Scylla. You're looking at a tombstone. An epitaph is the inscription upon a tombstone. This picture on the left here is the actual tombstone of a gentleman named Scelios. And he lives somewhere between uh, 200 BC and 100 AD. So there's about a 300 year window of time where we know that this was from. And uh, he was evidently somebody pretty wealthy and important to do. And on the tombstone, you can see the uh, big, bold, uppercase Greek letters, the inscription on his tombstone. Now, if you read ancient Greek, you can make that out fairly easily. You'll notice that it reads left to right. And uh, funny enough, there is no space between words and there's no punctuation at the end of sentences to indicate a break. Though That would be an innovation that wouldn't come across later until Latin and uh, the Romans. But if you, again, if you read Greek, you can make this out. Now, the interesting bit is that if you look closely above the Greek letters, there's these funny squiggles and lines, and this is an attempt at musical notation. The picture on the right, uh, on top of the musical staff, you'll see uh, the inscription that's actually on the tombstone, and you'll see the dots and dashes and lines and funny uh, squiggles that are trying to indicate the tune. Below that, you'll see in modern musical notation, in modern musical notation, you'll see uh, the actual tune as it survives today. Now, this has been passed down in an oral tradition ever uh, for over 2,000 years now, and you can still hear it. It's very popular. And uh, this is our first song. This is a tune. So, our listening list number one is the Epitaph of Scelios. We don't know who wrote it. Um, we're going to call this a Hellenistic Ionic song for our genre. Now, that's a crazy looking title, so let's break that down. Hellenistic refers to a time period. The Hellenistic period uh, is a specific time period in ancient Greece. Ionic because it's written in an Ionian mode. And uh, the date, again, is somewhere between 200 B.C. and 100 A.D. The link that you'll see there to YouTube will take you to uh, the video where you can listen to this song. Thanks to listen out for R, the fact that you're going to hear instruments. You're going to hear a kithara, which is like a Greek lyre uh, or, or um, harp. You're going to hear drums. You're going to hear singing in ancient Greek. When she gets to the word silipo, that is skelios in ancient Greek. And uh, the tune is very repetitive. You'll hear the same tune over and over and over and over again uh, with different combinations of instruments. Uh, it's a very catchy tune. Ironically enough, 
it of all of our five listening examples, it is the oldest, but it sounds probably the most modern to uh, to our ears. So why don't you go ahead and take a look at that? Uh, I'll link a dis I'll uh, put a link in the description of this video so you can find it easily. There's an entire playlist on the channel there for all five of these songs. So now that you've listened to number one on the listening list, it's uh, time to kind of set some background information, that all-important context that I was talking about earlier. Uh, I don't think that anybody really hates history. I think that they, unfortunately, we teach it as boring, and that we forget to, to talk about the things that really um, make everything make sense to us. I think a little bit of a background knowledge and context is key for understanding uh, what was happening. So, to give you that context, here are some some highlights, some bullet points that are directly going to affect the, the, the world that we're talking about during this time. So we're talking about Europe uh, at the end of the 5th century AD. So we're talking about the end of the 400s. And uh, these are some of the important bits, uh, the things that happened. This is a very crude timeline. The, here are the main bullet points to get us from A to B. Let's talk about where we ended up, and then we'll connect the points. Where we're going to end up is that we're uh, talking about the 5th century in Europe, which is basically the end of the Roman Empire. Uh, we're talking about a lot of different types of people with a lot of different types of, of ideas, and uh, the thing that's unifying, unifying them together is... The, uh, the government and the state-sponsored religion, which is Christianity during this time. And so the, Ro the Roman Empire and the Roman Catholic Church are the, the big unifier for a tremendous part of the known world during this time, basically all of Europe. When Rome falls in 476, and that's the one date that you have to memorize for this test, there's only one, 476, that's the year that Rome fell. Uh, the city of Rome, the capital, was laid siege to by a group of German barbarians known as the Visigoth. Uh, Alaric the, and the Visigoths were uh, pretty angry at, at Rome and the emperor, and they uh, laid siege to the city for every year. And when they finally tore into the capital, the government fell and, and Rome fell in 476. Once that happens, the only institution left standing was the Roman Catholic Church. And that's the beginning of the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages were not called the Dark Ages because the lights went out, but because it's basically the world came to an end. I want you to imagine the walking dead minus the zombies. Okay, so that's where we're going to end up. And why that's important for us is because this earliest type of music that we know anything about for, for sure dates back to the Roman Catholic Church during as, uh, as late ago as the 200s, the 3rd century. Really quickly, and you can skip ahead uh, to the next part of the video if you'd like, but to connect those dots, uh, here are the things uh, to know about... Um, uh, about these bullet points. Okay, first of all, let's talk about uh, this stuff over here on the left-hand side. So, uh, the BC. First of all, BC stands for before Christ. Uh, and from the year one going backwards, the dates are going to go small, and the, and the further back you go from the year one, the dates get larger. So B.C. stands for before Christ. This is our modern calendar is a Catholic calendar. Now, you'll also see in your textbooks more increasingly now B.C.E., which just means before common era. Now, instead of A.D., uh, we uh, we will see uh, C.E. for common era. So B.C.E. means before common era. It's the same thing. Uh, so here are some of the bullet points on the left. Uh, about 1,250 years before the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, the Greeks are becoming more or less a thing. We were just talking about them. About 1100 BC, that's 1,100 years before uh, Jesus is born, the uh, different tribes of Abraham, these different 12 tribes uh, of, of, of 
uh, Israel formed together under King Saul to form the kingdom of Israel. And then they keep, uh, keep on being conquered, uh, first by Babylon, then by the Persians, then by other people, and eventually by Rome. Uh, now, Rome itself is a city. It starts off in Italy. It starts off as a city. Then it becomes a kingdom. Then that kingdom becomes a republic, a, a democracy. And the Roman Republic lasts for about roughly 500 years or so until four, uh, 49 BC, a guy named Ju Julius uh, becomes dictator and, and Rome becomes an empire. Now that Rome's an empire, it becomes a military machine bent on conquest and now we're into uh, the A.D. All right, so A.D. stands for Anno Domini. Anno Domini is a Latin phrase which means the year of our Lord. It's an abbreviation. It doesn't mean after death. Uh, the reason that we are living in the 21st century and the 2000s is because there was no century zero. The years 1 through 100 were the first century. So if you were born in the 2000s, you'll be born in the 21st century. I was born in the 1900s, so I was born in the 20th century. A lot of people kind of get confused by that. Uh, the bullet points here on the right are uh, for, during the first century, there's some uh, monumentous changes happening here. A guy named Jesus of Nazareth is born. He is martyred by the Romans uh, at, to quell a... Um, political uprising in Judea, and after his martyrdom, after he is executed, after he is crucified, uh, a new religion begins that's an outgrowth of Judaism. So uh, it starts as uh, Jesus and his followers are Jewish, and then this new religion that grows out of it incorporates uh, uh, elements of Judaism, and it becomes its own new thing, and it spreads throughout uh, the Roman Empire. And it's not just for Jews, it's for uh, what the Jews call Gentiles as well, or the non-Jewish people. And so it begins to spread all across the Roman Empire. Um, by the year 313 AD, it has become so prevalent and so popular that the Emperor Constantine sees which way the wind is blowing, and he decides to unify uh, all of his uh, kingdom, all of uh, his empire, which is Rome, under the single banner of Christianity. Now, this empire is eventually split up into two halves, the eastern and the western halves, that uh, begin to increasingly uh, behave more independently, but that's uh, for a different video. And then, of course, finally, in 476, uh, Rome falls. So we know that Rome fell, and we know that the uh, Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, is basically the only institution left standing. And it's also the earliest type of music that we know about for sure. So, the earliest type of music that we know about is Christian plain chant. It is the singing of chant that's central to Christian worship. It is the sung version in Latin... Remember, Latin was the language of the people during the time. It was the official language of Rome, and it was the one language that even if you didn't speak it as your native tongue, you could kind of get by in. So it is the uh, plain chant is the sung version in Latin of the text of the Psalms, the Eucharist, or the Mass. And it's uh, plain chant is our last remaining musical link to ancient Rome and to the early Catholic Church. Now, uh, today, here's a little caveat. We're used to there being a number of different um, of faith traditions and expressions of Christianity today. But uh, we have to remember that um, during this time, there is only one Christian church, and it's the Catholic Church. So... I get it. There's a lot of words in there that we're probably just not so used to. Eucharist, Mass, all that stuff. I got you. I got you. Hold on. So, again, remember during this time, the only Christian church is the Catholic Church. And let's talk about what some of those words mean. A Mass is what Catholics call a church service. Uh, it's the worship service. And a Mass is very structured. It's, uh, that's called a liturgy. Uh, a, lit a liturgy is a set order of doing things in a certain way. 
Uh, every mass has certain elements of it that are universal and the same, and from time to time to time, different things about those may change, but the basic uh, shape and formula of the mass has remained the same. And for all the different parts of the mass, music is a uh, plays a tremendously important role during that. And chanting plays a very important part in that. If you were to go to a Catholic mass anywhere in the world uh, at any given time, first of all, they would all have the same readings from the Bible, and they would all be doing some of the things the same way. Other elements would be different depending on what congregation you were visiting. But uh, the music would also be, in many cases, standardized. So Mass just refers to the actual uh, service. Eucharist is the uh, what Protestants would call communion, if that word is more familiar to you. Uh, uh, the reason that a mass is called a mass is because it's uh, a part. The central part of the worship service for Catholics is the uh, act of communion. It is the uh, uh, the breaking of uh, the bread and the wine that symbolizes the body and blood of Christ uh, given as a sacrifice. Now, for Catholics, that's a that's the central part of their worship service. They don't view it as symbolic. They view that as uh, the uh, the literal uh, body and blood of Christ, and uh, there is music that goes along with that. So that's what the word Eucharist means. And of course, again, Latin is going to be the language that we're going to hear in all this. Now, chanting itself is a Middle Eastern tradition. It is an outgrowth of Judaism. Chanting is a huge part of the Jewish tradition and Hebrew tradition, and it naturally carries over into uh, Christianity. The early, uh, early, early, early Jewish church fathers would, of course, uh, spoken more Hebrew, and uh, Greek and Aramaic was their uh was most of their uh, day-to-day language. Uh, but within a few hundred years, as Christianity becomes uh, more and more popular, it, that, of course, shifts into being Latin, which is the language that... Now, plain chant is often incorrectly referred to as Gregorian chant, named after Pope Gregory the Great of the 6th century. But this is a pretty bad uh, branding mistake in cultural history. Neither Pope Gregory or his bird really had anything to do with music. What he did do was to order all the chants to be codified in an attempt to standardize the worship uh, for the entire year across all of Christendom. And Christendom is a word that you'll hear in your history uh, classes, and that basically refers to the different kingdoms where Christianity is the uh, official state-sponsored religion, which is basically all of Europe during this time. Now, without any written music, monks had to memorize everything. Like a bad game of telephone, the tunes changed many times from their... So let's listen to our first example here. What are we going to hear? This plain chant is going to be uh, very strange sounding. It's going to have a meandering tune. It goes wherever it wants to on a will, on a whim, rather. There's no accompaniment, no instruments, or no rhythm other than the words. And the words are sung in a very, what we call, melismatic uh, fashion. They're going to be long sustains and held out, and then sometimes we're going to have some rhythm. But um, it's it's very difficult to understand the words that they're saying. Now, I'm not only talking about if you don't speak Latin, but even if you did speak Latin, uh, sometimes the words can be difficult to uh, to understand, which is generally why you'll see them in print and uh, know their meaning today. This is going to be monophonic texture. Mono, the prefix mono means one. Phonic means sound. This is a Latin compound word. Monophonic means one sound. This means that there's only one musical idea happening. You're going to hear in this uh, listening list uh, example, you're going to hear multiple people singing, but they're all going to be doing the exact same thing in the exact same way. This is monophonic plain chant. This example is De Profundis. This is uh, taken from text from Psalm 129. We don't know who wrote this, but we know that it dates back to 499 AD, so right at the beginning of the 6th century. Uh, you can take a look at that uh, link right here. 
uh, will take you to the listening list. And go ahead and listen to number two. At this point, you should have listened to example number two. Now, plain chant stayed the same for centuries until around the 700s AD when someone somewhere finally had the idea to begin adding young boys to sing with the monks as well. It sounds fuller and brighter with both high and low voices. So this is our first experiment in harmony. Again, if you'll remember back to our Unit 2 uh, in talking about music's fundamental elements, you'll remember that harmony <coughs> excuse me, harmony is the uh, sounding of multiple notes or one or uh, more different pitch, uh, pitches played at the same time. These prepubescent boys naturally sing an octave higher than the men. Now that means because their voices have not changed yet, that their voices naturally sound eight notes higher. An octave means eight. And young children naturally speak an octave above, or, uh, yes, above men. Now it's called an octave because in church music at the time, there were really only eight notes to choose from. And having boys and men sing an octave apart prompted another idea. What if you had two notes sung at the same time that weren't an octave? What if they were a completely different choice from the small uh, choice of eight? This is our first experiment in harmony. Having the boys sing an octave apart really sounded cool. But if you sing a fifth apart, if you sing a note that is five notes above that starting note, you end up with a perfect fifth. And by the way, for any of you guitarists out there, this is a power chord. It's still very much around today. A perfect fifth is a very power And that brings us to these guys. Our first experiments in harmony were rebellious monks messing around with the ordered chant of the day and making something completely new. That's right, these modern rock power chords were actually invented by 9th century monks. This new style of chant was called organum because it was thought to sound like an organ. What we're about to hear is the first experimentation in what we call harmony, and again, that's the simultaneous sounding of more than one note at a time. Parallel organum is what we call this type of plain chant. Now, it's still plain chant. It's still uh, liturgical music. It's still chanting in Latin, but it's going to have harmony in it. it hence the name organum. Parallel because it's still going to only be so adventurous. The monks were only willing to go so far. And these uh, lines indicate different musical ideas. So in these examples, the uh, all the different singers, even though they may be singing one of two different notes, they're going to move up and down together. They're going to be in complete unison, except for the pitches that they are singing. This is an example of homophonic texture. Again, look at this Latin compound word. The prefix homo means same. Phonic, again, means sound. So same sound. This means the same texture. So we have two different notes, but homophonic texture. And that brings us to listening list example number three. This is Rex Chali Domine. This is from a collection of chants known as the Musical Incheratis. We do know who wrote this. Uh, Odo of Cluny. And uh, there's some other folks who say maybe somebody else wrote it, but we're going to go with Odo. And this, again, for a genre, is parallel organum. It's still a flavor of plain chant, but it's parallel organum, and it dates back to 906 A.D. So there's our link to YouTube. Go ahead and take a look and a listen to this. And notice, again, the two different pitches, but the uh, same texture moving up and down together.
So now that you've listened to number three, let's talk about our third flavor of plain chant, and that is drone organum. So the experiments with uh, the octave and the perfect fifth prompted another idea, an experiment. What if we were to take one of the notes and simply hold it out? Like a drone. Well, that's what the word drone means, to be sustained. Out. This is where one singer or instrument would stay on one continuous pitch th throughout the entire piece. Now, I say instrument because this instrument that you're looking at right here is called a symphony. And it was designed to uh, play one specific note because singing that one note for so long would be incredibly taxing and boring. So, it's called a symphony. Now, the symphony, interestingly enough, develops into this unwieldy-looking instrument called a hurdy-gurdy. Somebody in one of the other classes has informed me that there is a uh, some sort of game uh, to deal with pirates. It's an online game, and uh, one of the things that you can do is play some of their instruments, and a hurdy-gurdy is one of them. A hurdy-gurdy is like take two on the symphony, and it's got a little hand crank there, and the hurdy-gurdy can change its pitch depending on uh, these different buttons that you're pressing there on the side. So let's talk about our first composer uh, for Drone Organum. This is our first confirmed female composer in human history, and ladies, enjoy this because it's going to take a while to get another one. This is Hildegard, uh, Hildegard von Bingen, or of Bingen. Now, Bingen is not her last name. That simply is the town in Germany where she's from. It's important to realize that during this time, most people do not have two names. Uh, they only have one name. For example, Leonardo da Vinci his last name is not Da Vinci. Da Vinci. Da means of. Vinci is a city. His name was just Leonardo. Uh, Hildegard von Bingen. Von in German means of. And so Hildegard von Bingen is just saying Hildegard from Bingen. Now, she was a German nun. Uh, she was an abbess. That's the head nun at a convent. She was a writer. She was a composer, a theologian. Uh, somebody who studies the Bible and who uh, thinks about uh, different uh, theological concepts. She was a philosopher and uh, what's known as a polymath. So she was a genius. She was uh, extremely talented in a number of different fields and disciplines. Uh, again, she's a composer, our first known female composer. The fact that we know anything about her at all at a time in history where we're extremely... Uh, uh, patriarchal and uh, sexist is it should tell you something of the importance of this lady. She wrote and composed many chants uh, and for a variety of li different liturgical purposes. She was a mystic and a prophetess who had visions from God. She's a uh, canonized saint in the Catholic Church. She's also the founder of European natural history. Now, natural history is basically would cover a number of different fields and disciplines today, including botany, biology, chemistry, and so on and so forth. So she was a fascinating lady. Uh, but we are going to be studying her as a composer. Which brings us to listening list number four. This is Ovis Eternitas. It was written by Hildegard von Bingen. And it's an example of drone organum. Now, during this example that you can click on the uh, the link there and listen to, I want you to listen out for, again, the title. The way to tell all these apart from each other is uh, during the chance to listen to the opening words. They all begin with the, uh, the words that make up the title. And uh, I want you to think uh, female singer, female composer. And the drone will be pretty evident and uh, easy to hear. While you're listening to this, let me show you the translation of the text that she wrote. Uh, on the left here is the original Latin, and on the right is its translation into English. This text is not taken uh, from the Bible, but rather is an original composition by Hildegard herself. Now, when a monk or a nun sang plain chant in the centuries before around 800 AD, what they had in front of them was just the text in Latin of what they were singing. Just the text. They had to memorize the entire melody. Basically, they had to memorize the entire Bible in song. Now, this is one of the most spectacular feats of memory in the entire human race, 
but it's also pretty crazy, and very few people could actually do it. It took monks or nuns anywhere from 10 to 20 years to memorize all of this plain chant repertoire for the entire liturgical calendar. And keep in mind, that's over half of your life expectancy during this time. So, as you can imagine, it was deemed very desirable to find some way and remind yourself of where the tune might go. What you're looking at are squiggles. Officially, they're called neumes, but squiggles is what they are. The red line here on this uh, piece of, not parchment, but vellum, and during this time, everything is written by hand. There's no copy machines, there's no printing press, everything had to be written by hand. And the only people who can read and write during this time are the clergy members. Kings and queens can't even read and write. It's not deemed to be important for them to do so. And uh, it's not written on parchment paper, but it's written on vellum. Vellum is a little bit sturdier than parchment, which is why we have so many beautiful manuscripts from this time. Uh, vellum is actually made from animal skins. But the red line there represents a pitch, a musical note, then the text underneath it all is the uh, the words, the text in, in Latin of what you're chanting. And the squiggles, the, the funny looking ink dots and, and blobs, are an indication of where the tune might go above or below that red line. Hundreds of years went by and squiggles were the best that we could do. This is a page from the Winchester Troper. It's the oldest known example of notated organum. It's the painstaking work of Anglo-Saxon monks. And they're neumes above the text and then the margins to try and show where the tune might go up or down over any given syllable. It's better than nothing, but of course it has one huge glaring disadvantage. It supposes that you already know the tune. And that's because they're not very good at showing you just how high or how low the notes are supposed to be. It's like looking at a map without any longitude or latitude. So, that brings us to one of our first monumental moments in music history. This is an event so earth-shattering that it forever changed music's course irrevocably. This is one of those moments that we're going to call a Big Bang moment. And it is the development of notation, the ability to write music down. The breakthrough came in around the year 1000 AD. This is going to be the legendary choir master and teacher Guido de Arezzo. That's Guido of the city of Arezzo. Guido's methods were simple and clear. He gave the neumes a standardized and easy-to-read form. Each note is going to have its own symbol or blob, and then he placed the blob on four lines that represented the exact pitch. If the blob went up, the note went up, and if the blob went down, the note went down, but in a very precise, measured-out mathematical way. Every line and every space on this rung or staff is going to equal a specific note. This is version 1.0 of the exact same system that we use today and the exact same system that we learned as a class in Unit 2. The modern staff has five lines, Guido's had four, but the basic principle of it is still the same. In fact, you can even see here the early attempt at a clef. What he's indicating here in this piece of organum is that this line is going to represent the pitch C. If this is a C, then this would be a D and an E. If this is a C, then we're going down. This would be a B, an A, and a G. This example of plain chant would therefore start on a G. Now, Guido is a very famous choir master and teacher, and he invented not only the, the four-line staff, but he also invented the modern solfege syllables. You might have heard these from the sound of music as do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, and ti, do. And their solfege is a teaching tool used to help young singers develop good pitch recognition, and it also helps to learn the tune and the relationships and the intervals between notes before you go in to put into words. Now, Guido's solfege syllables were a little different. His were ut, re, mi, fa, so, and la. 
And thankfully, somebody decided to change uh, which sounds like you're about to vomit, to dough. Guido also had another handy teaching tool, and this was uh, what is known as the Guidonian hand. If you were to look at your palm right now, you'll notice that each digit can be divided up into three segmented chunks uh, separated by the crease in your fingers where your joints are. Now, Guido would take each one of these sections of your uh, fingers and of your palm, and he would point to a different point on his hand, and that would represent a different soulfish syllable in a different pitch. And he could teach his young students, these young children, a new tune pretty quickly by, by pointing onto his palm and teaching them by rope. After the invention of notation, music began an unprecedented leap forward in complexity. The ability to formulate on the page allowed for composers to become far more ambitious. A story has to be spoken uh, aloud, uh, cannot be as complex as a novel, which can develop over a much greater length of time. So too, music became much more lengthy. Now that you can have multiple lines of music happening at once, thanks to Organum's style of plain chant, dazzling new ideas for harmony began to suggest themselves as well. What was needed for these discoveries to really be made was for a composer to take them and to really break them out and do something brand new. Enter Periton, our French composer from the 12th century who wrote music for the brand new cathedral at Notre Dame, brand new during his day. He was an inventor, and he was a master of polyphony. That's the layering of many voices. We also call that the Ars Antiqua style. Basically, that's the uh, he was the guy who came up with what Middle Age sacred music was going to sound like for the next few hundred years. He's a big deal. Again, his name is Periton, and he invented chords. His music, now this is not going to sound like a big deal to us today, but to the ears of our 12th century ancestors, it was nothing less than a musical revolution. Periton strikes us even today as an adventurous composer. He conceived of and wrote down the most complex simultaneous note clusters that anyone had ever heard. Simultaneous note clusters is a fancy way of saying chords. Multiple This is a very advanced harmony. As if that wasn't enough to secure his place in music history, Periton also incorporated rhythm for the first time into church music, into plain chant. And he also came up with a way of writing it down. His way to write it down was to beam the shorter notes together with what he called ligature marks. In fact, we still call them ligature marks today. If you look at these beam together notes, they look like modern day eighth notes. Periton was very fond in particular of one uh, rhythmic pattern, which is the dotted 8 16th figure, which we'll hear in our final listening list. So this takes us to our final listening example, number five, Venerant Omnes. This was written by Periton in 1198. It was uh, sung for the first time on Christmas Day, 1198. It is a sacred four-part chorale. That basically means that it is written for four voices to be sung. This is not plain chant. This is a song. It's a sacred song, but it's still a song. It's not plain chant. This uh, uh, is a common prayer, Venerant Omnes. And one of the things that you're going to notice when you listen to it is that they take an incredibly long amount of time to actually finish singing the title. Uh, they hold out the first letter of the first word, V, v for a very long time, over half a minute. And then it takes them even longer to finish out the first word. So hang in there, but try and listen to this with 12th century ears. You've never heard any sort of rhythm in church music before, and you've never heard any sort of harmony. This blows your mind. The amount of complexity and the sheer amount of difference between what was happening secures Periton's place in history as a genius. So, go ahead and at this time listen to example number five. Once you've done that,
Congratulations, you made it. This is the end of the video for uh, part one in the Story of Music series uh, covering ancient music. I hope this video has been helpful for you. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. Good luck!